Hey, can I back you up for a second? Yeah. How do they get to the sales call? Like, yeah. So, yeah. So for us, and I think what you can have to I can't just call you up, can I? You cannot call me up. Uh, okay. If you call me, I will not answer your phone. <laughs> I will not talk to you. It's not going to happen. So we have a process, and I think a lot of firms are trying to adopt this, uh, either having a web form or a type form or something where they're kind of uh, putting information in about their company um, and answering some questions, right? And I think that's a good okay. kind of uh, way to start that kind of qualification process with a client. You know, you don't want, especially if you're a niche firm, you don't want non-niche clients wasting your time on a sales call, right? It's not, you already know it's not a good fit for you. Um, right. You're more likely to add them on and take on a bad client than doing that, right? And so um, you want to kind of weed those clients out. Are you still chasing down AR from this tax season? Are you struggling to move your practice to a monthly recurring revenue model? With Practice Ignition, you can easily manage your client engagement letters and collect ACH or credit card payments all in one place. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Practice Ignition, later in the episode. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Earmark Podcast. I am your host, Blake Oliver, CPA, and I'm joined today by Josh Lance, CPA. Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Blake. Uh, thanks for having me here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your practice? Yeah, so I am the founder and managing director of Lance CPA Group, which is a virtual and remote CPA practice that I started about six years ago. Uh, we specialize in working with craft breweries and digital agencies. Um, so we uh, are highly niched and we are you know, really focused on providing those accounting and consultant and tax services to our clients. Craft breweries, digital agencies, great combo there. Fun fact, you teach a class on entrepreneurship at Northwestern University. I do. Where yeah. where I used to uh where I was a student. Although yeah. back in the day I was a music major, not uh an entrepreneur student or a business student. So, I never got the benefit of your predecessors. Yeah, yeah, no, it's <laughs> uh, it's a fun class to teach for sure. That's for sure. Well, we're here today to talk about something that is very entrepreneurial. Probably one of the hardest things that we do as CPAs and as accountants, and that is selling, specifically selling advisory services. This is a challenge because advisory is often not well defined. And so we need to talk about your definition of advisory. I'm very eager to hear it. What types of advisory services that you sell in your firm? Uh, and then you know, let's talk about how we actually uh, do the sell, how we how we do sales, and that's hard because mm -hmm. it's not something that as accountants we are taught how to do. It's something that we sort of, well, at least I anyway, learned by accident. I'm not sure how. <laughs> how did you get your sales training, Josh? Did you just get dropped into the fire? Yeah, pretty much. It's mostly by accident, right? It's just like you're, you're dropped in. You're trying to figure out as you go along, see what works, see what doesn't work, and that's always the best way to do it. But I think that's the way a lot of accountants get into doing sales is. You just go out and try to do it, and and you fall on your face a little bit, and you try to figure out as you go along. And are you doing the sales in your firm, or have you managed to delegate that? I have managed to delegate that. Yeah, I, I do some sales from time to time, but uh, mostly it's delegated, which is is nice. Well, that's impressive because you're still a fairly a small firm, right? How many staff do you have? We have twenty two people on staff. Okay. Well, you've grown a lot since the last time we talked. That's I think last time it might have been a dozen. Or, yeah. or something. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks. Okay, great. So, well, let's let's get into it then. Let's talk yeah. about selling advisory services. Uh, and where do we start? I suppose I, well, I already I already have a question in my mind, which is I asked it to everyone who talks about advisory. How do you define it, Josh? I, I think when it comes to advisory, it is really looking out for the needs of your clients and and trying to help them achieve their goals, right? from a kind of a broad range perspective. Now, how you actually do that from a day-to-day -day or a type of work perspective may be different, right? You know, you may be focused a lot on KPIs, you may be focused a lot on cash flow or whatever that may be. But the end goal is our clients need help in a certain area. They come to us as the experts and we're able to provide that insight and expertise to help them achieve their goals or achieve the outcomes they're looking to uh, obtain. Well, let me play devil's advocate. I mean, aren't we already doing this when we do bookkeeping, when we do tax, when we do payroll, bill pay? A lot of us are doing stuff for clients all the time. Like, what's the difference between that and advisory? 
Yeah, I think we, a lot of times we already do it. We do it for free or we're not putting a, a value price or a or something on it that shows it as value outside of the work we're currently doing. And I think we struggle having that conversation with our client to say like, hey, you should be paying me for this advice, right? Like you may have contracted me to do your tax return, but that does not mean I give you tax planning. Now, I think historically and with a lot of accountants, we do that, right? Client calls up, asks a question, we answer the question, we help them out, and we aren't, aren't really kind of identifying that as advisory services. I think that's stuff that we've already kind of do inherently. I think the question is, how do you actually sell it on its own on, own two legs and, and make sure that you are getting the value that you are providing uh, from your clients? So that's interesting. We We may already be doing this. We just mm-hmm. haven't surfaced it for the client. We haven't sold it. We haven't attached a value or a price to it. So by, by, by formalizing it, you're saying we can, we can get more out of these client relationships. Yeah. I think part of it is is that formalization of this is an actual service we provide. uh, And this is how we provide, and this is what you expect to get from it. I think the other part of it is just changing our mindset on how we actually operate the fundamentals of our firm. Um, if our firm is very much a compliance, uh, transactional type work focused firm, um, it's hard for us to get out of that mindset of, of doing that type of work, right? And we kind of prioritize that, or that's what we kind of come to market with. But when we do advisory services, what we're really doing is really kind of changing the fundamentals of our firm up. We really are, you know, operating first from an advisory perspective. And yeah, we'll do that bookkeeping, or yeah, we'll do that tax return. Uh, but you come to us for that advisory perspective. You come for, uh, to us for the expertise we are bringing to you. Um, and in doing so, we will be able to you know, help you achieve your goals and help you uh, maybe look at different outcomes you want to get to. Uh, but that's where we're going to start first. And then, yes, we may be doing these other things as well. But I think that's a fundamental shift in how we operate our firms because it takes the onus of advisory off of the owner of the firm. And it really changes to everyone is participating in that advisory work within your firm. And the impact can be pretty significant financially. Mm -hmm. Uh, There was a study that was done by Mm CPA.com, a division of the AICPA. I think it was called the Business Model Trends Mm -hmm. Survey. And they found that you could increase revenue by 20, 30, 40% just by adding in advisory to existing services, like if you're already doing bookkeeping and tax prep, mm-hmm. people are willing to pay more for you know, 24% more if you add advisory to that. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. I think that really gets to that point of what the clients actually value is that expertise. Yeah. They like the tax return for to be done because they don't want to go to jail and, and it's a requirement of, of what needs to happen here, but they really advise, they really value what that advice is. And so we package that in with other services like the CPA.com report had, um, you see that substantial change because clients are so much willing to pay for that. And I think that's where that, that missed opportunity lies is we're so focused on selling a bookkeeping service or so focused on selling a tax service that we miss what the clients actually need. Uh, and we're not selling that. And instead we give it away for free because we're doing this part of our, our tax service or bookkeeping service. So I like this idea, a lot of advisory around the existing services we already provide, because it means we don't have to go out and figure out how to do something new like CFO yeah. services when we've never done it. So let's, uh, let's dig into that a bit. Okay. Uh, you know, what are the most common services people are doing these days when it comes to monthly ongoing stuff? It's accounts payable, mm-hmm. payroll. Yeah, um, I think... Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of things we already do, right? Like it's like accounts payable is a good example. I think a really, really good example of this. When it comes to accounts payable, right? Your client says, hey, can you handle RAP, right? And so you enter the bills and the bill pay software and you schedule them for payment and the client approves them. And, and that's the work we do. We take a very transactional approach to it. To the point where we're even charging per bill in many cases, right? That's right, how yeah, a lot we're of charging us- per bill. Yeah, we'll, we'll charge you, you know, we'll do $10 okay. per bill, right? And so we've yeah. really kind of labeled it as a transactional type service. We are provided in that way. But the reality of why someone wants us to handle AP and what's actually going on there is really more along the lines of cash flow management. And how do we manage our cash flow? And how do we understand where we're spending our money? 
and what is going on there, right? Like, so the work isn't the paying the bill. The work is actually the, well, what does this mean in context of their business? And what does it mean in context of, you know, managing their cash flow? And do they have enough cash to pay this bill? Or should we wait to pay that till next week? Because we have other expenses we need to incur this, week, right? And so uh, if we go to AP, the AP process and take it from really a advisory perspective, there's a lot more insight we can unlock and there's a lot more value we can provide there. And yeah, we'll do those bill pay things because we can do that as part of trying to manage that process and and provide that advisory service. But that's really where the value is, uh, is in there, right? You know, I think payroll is another example of that too, right? Payroll, very compliance based, get people paid. You know, it's payroll taxes and all that fun stuff, right? Very in that realm. But a lot of times when you're providing payroll services, the questions you get aren't about, you know, what's the state unemployment tax rate in my my state I'm in. It's, okay, I'm looking to hire more people. Can we afford to do that? Or uh, what kind of benefits can I provide, right? Like those are the advisory opportunities that exist there. Uh, and if we think about that first, and really that's what matters to the client, not so much that payroll happens, right? They're going to expect you to do payroll and they're going to expect you to pay the people on the right time uh, frames. But it's really that, it's really that the, the things that come along with that. And so that's where that kind of fundamental change means the flip of, are we thinking about it in terms of what does the client actually trying to get out of this? What's their needs from this? Or are we just trying to do that transactional service because we're accountants? We know what, that's what we do. Well, I think a, a big part of the problem is that a lot of this advisory work does take folks like partners, directors, manager level folks and above. And in a small firm, you're typically a pretty flat organization. So right. it's the partner who ends up having to answer those questions, but they're often, they're often really busy. So right. you've got to, in deciding to sell this service, you have to make time so that you're available to the clients when mm. they do come to you for these mm. questions. Because the worst thing would be if you, right. if you sold it and you said, I'm going to do cash management, but then you never actually have time to look at their, yeah. um, their reports and, and, and do that for them or sit down when they mm. have questions. Because like, you have to be in it more than just every now and then. It has to be a regular regular thing. Right. But, but I guess then the benefit is you get to charge more, right? So you can have right. fewer clients. Correct. It's, it's and I think, yeah, I think yeah. that's where the value too of getting your whole firm involved is right. Like, yeah, some of those insights, you, you, you know, we tend to have that partner level one you know, person do that work. Right. Um, but the problem with that, that's not a very scalable service. If the partner is the one that has to be able to deliver those advisory insights and do the type of work, they have a limited bandwidth to do it they're not going to be fully into it. They're not seeing a lot of what's going on. And that makes it for where I think where a lot of firms have frustrations with advisory services is that, like, yes, we want to do it. That makes sense. But the owner's doing all the work and they're like, hey, this sucks. I don't want to do all the all the work here. Right, um, right. So what do we, how do we get uh, staff doing that kind of yeah. stuff? Like, do you have any examples in your firm? Do you do this AP advisory work or something else where you've got your your higher level staff doing this advisory? We do, yeah. So again, I'll use AP as a good example of this, right? You know, we, we see AP more in the sense of it's cash flow management, it's how do we, you know, track our spend, it's what we're spending things on and advising clients, okay, what should we do, you know, in the upcoming weeks as we think about um, how we run our businesses. And so, you know, that's something that I think would traditionally fall on my shoulders, but we've kind of taught our team like, okay, well, here's how we do it. Here is the Lance CPA group way of providing the service. Here's the things we would look for. Here's the things that we, want to make sure we're keeping aware of. Uh, and I think in doing that and kind of developing it out for our team, they're able to deliver that. And when there are questions or things that come up, right, they're not going to be able to do 100% of it, but they're going to be able to do 95% of it. And they can come to me for that other 5% and I can step in there. Um, you know, so I think that's one forecasting is another one. We've just been talking a lot about that in our firm of, you know, uh, a lot of our staff accounts struggle with forecasting because there's not a, mm -hmm. there's not a right answer there, right? Like you're, doing a forecast, you're getting some data and inputs and things like that, but then you're making some assumptions and you're coming out with some numbers, right? And you know inherently in doing a forecast that that number you come up with is likely never going to be correct, right? That's going to be close. It's going to be in the right direction, hopefully, but it's not going to be the exact answer. And so, uh, and I think for a lot of accountants, there's a struggle with that of, well, I do my work, my balance sheet balances, debits equal credits, like everything is, there's a right answer to come out to and forecasting there's not, right? There's a, a guess mm -hmm. as to where the right answer is. And so um, it's trying to get some of that mindset shift of like, okay, well, 
when you do this, you don't have to come up with, there's not gonna be a perfect answer here, right? Like I could give that same problem to three different people in my firm and they're coming up with three different forecasts. And that's okay. As long as we have the right inputs and we're thinking about it critically, we're gonna get close to where we need to be. And so I think kind of helping people kind of get out of that accountant mindset of like, well, everything's gotta be right and everything's gotta be buttoned up to, okay, well, this is a little bit of an art. There's a little bit of thinking creatively and kind of thinking outside the box as you do this work. And so uh, that's I a think struggle. That's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle, but yeah. you have to kind of train that in and say, it's okay. Try this out. You're not going to be perfect. It's not going to be right all the time, but it's okay as we do that. In my firm, uh, cloud sourced accounting, which I have sold in 2015, we, we did a lot of bookkeeping, cloud mm -hmm. bookkeeping. And one of my, big struggles with our bookkeepers was helping them understand materiality right. <laughs> because the last thing I wanted and the last thing the client wanted, well, we were on fixed fees. So the client didn't care. Right. But I cared a lot. Yeah. I didn't want them hunting for a $10 when yeah. the, the client had, you know, $10,000 moving through the bank mm -hmm. account or hundreds of thousands. Right? right. It just, it's, it's a waste of time. So I, uh, I would periodically educate them. And I, I suppose it's, it's true for that forecasting. There's uncertainty and that's right. okay. Yeah. You have to get yeah, okay, okay with, okay the, with the uncertainty. You have to be okay with the art of this. Um, and as and long it, as you get that and get the concept, you'll do okay. And you don't have to try to be perfect in this and there'll be someone reviewing it and you can talk to each other and talk to me, but you can do this work, right? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to create a forecast. Just understand who the client is and what what's going on and what they expect to happen in the future. And then you can kind of craft that. So I think we've identified a few different places in the firm where we could look for advisory. Mm -hmm. There's obviously the stuff we're doing already. The AP is a great example. Go from paying bills to doing cash management. Mm -hmm. Go from doing payroll to doing people advisory. Yeah. Go from doing bookkeeping to doing some light financial forecasting. And there's yeah. a lot of tools out there that can help you do this. And that's important too, right? You got to have right. the right tech to make sure that you as the partner don't get bogged down doing it all yourself. So let's talk about then starting the sale. Let's say I, I, I'm, I'm a firm owner and I've never done this before. I've always done mm. the transactional kind of work. Um, where do you suggest, since I've identified an area, and we can use AP as the example, I think it's yeah. a great one. Where do I, where do I, where would you have me start fixing up my sales flow? Yeah, so I think it, I mean, it first starts with you as the owner and the person doing the sales in taking a approach in this, like you are the expert. I love this. There's a quote from Blair ends um, who has a great book on sales called the win without pitching manifesto. And in that book, he talks about you are the prize to be won. Uh, you are the, the person's coming to you. That client is coming to you because you are an expert. You're the person that can help them solve a problem or help, help them get to where they need to go. Uh, and so too often we forget that in the process of sales and we jump in there and we're talking price right away and we're negotiating against ourselves and, and we're, we struggle with actually selling what we want to sell. Um, and so, you know, kind of having that idea in mind of one, I'm the prize to be one, uh, is that it allows me to go into that conversation knowing that. Um, I'm the expert here. I am the one who's going to lead this client, not have the client lead me. And if this is not the right fit, if this is not going to work out, then that's okay. I'm okay with that. I want the right clients for our firm. Uh, and not everyone's going to be the right client for our firm. Even if they're in our niche um, or even if they want the services we can sell, they may not be the right fit for our firm. And so um, instead of just trying to sell everyone who comes to us or everyone who has a pulse or everyone that <laughs> wants to, you know, give us money, right? Like we have to be discerning and selective about that. I think even more so now as firms struggle with staffing and yes. trying to get that work done is you have to be very selective about the work that you do uh, and take that, you know, that kind of expertise in mind of, yes, I'm the expert here. Um, so I think that's first and foremost, you know, for the person who's selling the work, you have to have that mindset going into it. I think the second part of it is you have to have a really standardized sales process um, that you're kind of following through each and every time, uh, ensuring that you're bringing the right clients in, ensuring you're asking the right questions, you know, getting people who are just trying to, you know, find out what the cheapest price is or whatever that is for that service. You're kind of getting them out before they even kind of qualify in. And so 
having that sales process developed and have that kind of follow each other time, I think is pretty key um, because that helps us get the right sales in the door. Yeah. One thing that I used that I kind of stumbled into in my practice was uh, an assessment fee. Mm -hmm. So we would charge a $500 fee, which I understand is actually fairly low these days, but that was my minimum fee to have us look through your QuickBooks file and figure out what was wrong with it, give you a little write-up of what we would do to fix it. You could go fix it on your own, or you could hire us. And that was wonderful. Once I implemented that, it got rid of all those people who were just looking to get as much free advice as they could out of me. Because I could say, after that first 15-minute call or 30-minute call, if you want to proceed, here is the fee to do this assessment. We'll dig into your file, yada, yada, yada. And those who weren't really interested in paying for anything, you know, they, they fell out right. of the process there. What are your feelings on that? Or do you have any other thoughts? Yeah. I mean, I love that from a practice because yeah, when it gets those tire kickers, those people just looking for the, the cheapest provider out the door. Um, but it also helps you do your sales proposal better. Um, because if you're going actually digging in the books and spending the time to figure out, okay, what actually needs to happen here, um, you're going to craft a much better proposal to that client than just someone who's like, all right, well, my cleanup price is X and it'll cost X dollars per month to do bookkeeping, right? And you can really kind of hone in on maybe some issues you're seeing there or uncover those advisory opportunities that um, you can bring up that you may not have you know, come across in the call, right? And also compensate you for that that diagnostic work, and that alone in itself, I think, is valuable. Um, even if that client never goes with you, you know, you spend the time, you know, to go through and give them kind of report of like, well, here's what I'm finding, here's our recommendations, has value in and of itself. Uh, and too often we give that away for free, and it, it's uh, it's kind of a, a, a lose lose if we if we ignore that, right? So, given that opportunity to get in there, dig in, get compensated for that work, but then also be able to craft a better proposal. Um, to really hone in on what what their needs are, I think is is key. Yeah, and whether or not you charge a fee for it, it is important to emphasize that it takes a lot of time to do yeah. this right. And you can't just, well, wh- let's rewind for a second and just talk about how most people do this today. I don't know if it's most people, but the old <laughs> the old time process was do a call with a prospect, give them some free advice, say, you want to work with me? Here's an engagement letter in my hourly rate. Yeah. Sign it and return it. No payment up front, right? No, generally no retainers. Yeah. I don't, I don't, lawyers use retainers all the time, but accountants, for some reason, even when they're billing hourly, forget to do it. Uh, so that's the old process. So walk me through your standardized, uh, non, non-old-timey non process. <laughs> yeah. So I think <laughs> when you come into a sales call, and really our objectives in that first sales call and in our process that we do, there's really kind of two sales calls or one and a half sales calls in the well, process. Can I back you up for a second? Yeah. How do they get to the sales call? Like, yeah. So, yeah. So for us, and I think what you can have to Because I can't about, just call you up, can I? You cannot call me up. Uh, okay. If you call me, I will not answer your phone. <laughs> I will not talk to you. It's not going to happen. So we have a process, and I think a lot of firms are trying to adopt this, uh, either having a web form or a type form or something where they're kind of uh, putting information in about their company um, and answering some questions, right? And I think that's a good okay. kind of uh, way to start that kind of qualification process with a client. You know, you don't want, especially if you're a niche firm, you don't want non-niche clients wasting your time on a sales call, right? It's not, you already know it's not a good fit for you. Um, right. You're more likely to add them on and take on a bad client than doing that, right? And so um, you want to kind of weed those clients out. So you're asking, are you a brewery? Are you a professional services yeah. firm? If they're not, you might respond and say, when they yeah. put in the request, you say, well, you know, well, that's not an industry we serve. Yeah. Here are some recommendations for other providers. Yeah, yeah. we even have it. We use a type form for our, our thing. And so when they answer that question, they answer it in our way incorrectly. It kicks them out of the process and says, hey, we're not a great fit for you. I'm sorry we didn't be able to serve you at this time, right? So it automatically oh, that's disqualifies great. them off the bat, which is... Uh, automatic rejection. Automatic that's rejection, nice. yeah. yeah. Um, but again, yeah. It, it, it saves you from wasting your time yeah. on clients that are right fit. Um, you know, in our qualification we do is every, every all of our clients have to be on either zero QuickBooks or one. That's the platform to work on. If you're not on that platform, um, you get kicked out. If you're on QuickBooks desktop, we'll ask, hey, are you willing to convert to, to being on the cloud? 
Uh, and if so, then you continue on the process. If not, you get kicked out again, right? And so um, you're doing that qualification process to make sure that ultimately that person you have a sales call with is in the ballpark of the right fit of the type, right type of client you want. Mm -hmm. um, they're the right industry. They're answering the questions correctly of kind of what their needs are. I've seen uh, firms where they'll put, you know, even brackets of like budget of, you know, hey, what's your budget for doing this work and kind of give some options there. Uh, and if you know you check the cheap option, you're going to get kicked out of the process, right? And so, you know, just kind of get in the right client on the sales call because you do not want to have a sales call with someone who is not the right fit. Um, and so, got it. So they, the, they make it past your first round yeah. of the form. Yeah. They get the sales call. Now we're in the sales call. So, yeah, I'm not going to make I'm not going to make you like enact a sales call with <laughs> me, although that that could be kind of fun, but yeah. Uh, I don't know if my skills, my acting skills are that good. So tell me, tell me like what, what, uh, yeah. How long is this initial sales call? Do you keep it, do you keep it short? How do you do it? Yeah. So we try to keep it no longer than 30 minutes. Uh, longer than that, you're starting to get in the realm of going away for your device. You're starting to get in the realm of prescribing without, you know, diagnosing. And so mm -hmm. um, we want to avoid that as much as possible. So um, that first call is really a, is this the right fit from a people perspective? Do they, um, kind of gel with us? Do they get us? Do we get them? Do they kind of understand our value proposition, right? Like, you know, you come work for us as a niched brewery firm and your brewery, you should expect to pay more than a generalist accountant who is out there, right? We're providing more, bring more to the table as a result. Um, and so there's going to be a different value proposition there. We also want to kind of know what do they actually want and what do they actually need, right? So, uh, you know, you may have a client that comes to you and says, oh, I need to get my books cleaned up because I haven't touched my books in nine months, right? But then you dig into it and they haven't, you know, filed returns in three years and, and you start to uncover that stuff, right? So um, we're really trying to dig, okay, what's actually, what are they actually trying to accomplish when you work with uh, a firm like ours, right? And then we start to talk about kind of getting into a scope component of what do you, you know, if we were to give you a proposal, what things would you find valuable in that? What things are you looking for? What things do you not want, right? It's just so we can start to narrow down uh, that scope conversation. Um, and that's really kind of that first call, right? Again, keeping it short and sweet. Um, from there, we assess internally, is this a good fit or not, right? So question you can, for you though, yeah. Qu before we get to that question, um, this is one that happens all the time. Okay. Client wants a price on the first call. What do you say? Um, we say um, we don't get prices on the first call for two reasons. One, we need to understand a little bit more about you. Um, and so that may be doing that diagnostic component of digging into your books. Um, but also we want to talk internally about our own capacity and how we can best serve you. Uh, so just throwing out okay. a blanket price, you know, says we have capacity to fill that or um, says that that makes the right sense for our, our trade and value and, and price. And so um, we want to make sure we can do this right by you, right? So, um, Got it. so we get that question a lot. There's always that question that comes up. Well, how much do you think it is? Well, we can't yeah, get that give price me a now. range. Or or give, give me a range, range right? And it's like, yeah. well, we can't get that price now. And we're not, and we even say like, we're not trying to be sneaky about it. It's just like, we have to make assessments about, you know, now that we've kind of heard from you and kind of heard from what your needs are, we have to assess, okay, how can we best serve you in this way? And that is part of that determination is, do we have the right people to help serve you in that way? So, um, so that's the time within we you know, end the call. Um, and then we get together, myself and my partner. So my partner is one who's typically doing those sales calls. Uh, and she'll kind of explain like, hey, here's what's going on. Here's what I think we need. And, and then we kind of talk price together. Um, and I may even have some questions like, okay, well, they're saying this. Well, maybe they want this or maybe we should offer something else. And, and we look at then our capacity internally and say, okay, well, do we have the right people to serve this or not? And uh, if it's a more senior person, that's going to change the price and dynamics and things like that. So um, we have that conversation and then we go to the proposal component, right? So, um, now, now, we, And I really want to dig into that proposal yeah. component because I think that's really important. Um, and this is not a, a pricing episode. We could do a whole episode, <laughs> probably do a series on pricing, but I'm just curious before we move on. Yeah. How do you tend to price? Do you come up with one price for the whole engagement or do you like build it up using different services with different prices? Do you estimate time? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's very much an art. And I think as we think about it, um, you know, I think for us in some ways, pricing changes daily, just depending on what's going on. Right. So if we had that same conversation the week before, we may have given a different price depending on, 
capacity changes or things we have going on or um, other opportunities that are in play, right? And so um, we really take it from a value pricing perspective with the kind of the caveat that, you know, we use a variety of factors to kind of think through things. So, you know, we do kind of back of the envelope, like, okay, well, if we do this work, how much time do you think it's going to take and who's going to be on there and what's our desired profit margin on that work? And let's kind of figure out that mm-hmm. out from like a floor perspective of uh, what's the minimum we can go here. And does that even make sense in this scenario? You know, we talk about, uh, you know, we'll bundle services together. So we usually go with like a three option proposal generally for our services. Um, and so we'll think about, okay, well, what different things are we going to include in those bundles or not? Um, in a lot of ways, it's standardized, but sometimes as you kind of start to dig in, we may take things out because we don't think it's necessary to replace it with something different. And so um, it, it really becomes this kind of art and dance that you kind of have to think through of what does this look like? How do we staff it? What are we trying to des- get as a desired profit margin? What are we trying to accomplish here internally by taking on this client? And then and then come up with a price from there. And usually it's and- to delivered as a fixed fee on a monthly recurring basis. And I think the really important thing you said that I want to highlight is that you weren't doing your pricing alone. You and your partner get together yeah. and check each other on yeah. this. Yeah. And I, I, th- I think that's really important. Not everybody has a partner, right. but they often have a life partner. And so I have yeah. heard it suggested before that if you don't have a business partner, have your spouse check your pricing because they're your best advocate right. a lot of the time. Yeah. It's and I think it's, it's, it's good to have those two perspectives on it too, because we'll kind of talk it through and think about scope. And then we'll kind of come, I'll kind of write my pa- my my number down on a piece of paper and she'll write her number down and then we share it and see how close we are in that. And sometimes like we're way off and then we have to kind of think, hey, what's, why are we way off? Um, and sometimes, you know, we, in doing so, that may uncover other ideas as to how we're going to approach this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I think it's helpful to talk it through with someone else. Even if you, you have an employee in your firm, um, it's you just a sole partner, but you have some employees talk it through with an employee Just say, okay, I have some ideas. Yeah. We have this new client. I'm going to throw some prices here or I'm going to throw some ideas out. How would you price that? What do you think here? Just to kind of get some gut checks on stuff. Cause sometimes you can, I think as accountants downplay your own value. And so you come up with a number yes. that's probably too low. Um, and if you talk to your team, they'll probably say that's too low too. Cause they're kind of thinking like, hey, how are you making profit if you're paying me to do this? And I'm yeah, yeah, I want my bonus at the end right. of the year. Yeah, so, right. so we better make sure we hit our number. Right. And yeah. so we found even like sometimes when we're unsure or we're thinking about, okay, well, there's a desired team member we want to put on this work. Let's run the price by them and see what they think. Yeah. Um, that, because it just good. kind of helps gut check some of that stuff too. And they see the price, right? They do the books for our clients. Right. And they see right. our charge come through, right? They know what we're getting from them. So um, they have a sense of like, you know, when things are rightly priced and when things aren't right, pr- aren't priced correctly. And so um, we've even had cl- uh, some of our team members come to us and say, like, hey, like, I don't think we're charging this client enough for the work we're doing. I know we get paid and this doesn't seem to be enough for all the things I'm doing for them. That is amazing. How did you get them to do that? Because my problem was always we were doing work and mm-hmm. the scope would grow and yeah. then we weren't charging enough. So you want this is this is what we really want is is our staff telling us when we're not charging enough on existing clients. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's you know uh, part of that's just being transparent with the team. So we're pretty clear on the team as to our profit margins. We share financials with our team. Like we're pretty open book as far as that goes. Um, but in doing so, that helps you know empower the team to make help make decisions, uh, whether that is pricing for a client or how we spend our money on different software or other expenses that we incur give them some opinions into that because sometimes mm-hmm. they'll see things or know things um, that we're not seeing um, and that can help us out. So, um, but I think That's especially great. when it comes to that, you know, how you price your client, I mean, they know how much we get because they see that come through every month as to what the price is <laughs> and they know how much work they do and they yep. know their work for the other clients they work with too, right? Which are all either breweries or digital agencies. So they know right. like, Hey, this seems off compared to what we're doing else. Maybe we should raise our price. This episode of Earmark is sponsored by Practice Ignition. Are you still chasing down AR from past tax seasons? Are you struggling to move your practice to a monthly recurring revenue model? With Practice Ignition, you can easily manage your client engagement letters and collect ACH or credit card payments all in one place. Streamline your sales process and upsell services by allowing your clients to choose from up to three proposal options. 
Once they choose their desired proposal, the clients select their preferred pricing option, enter their payment details, and sign, all in one place. With Practice Ignition, you can set up automatic payments from your clients on any billing schedule imaginable. Monthly recurring, annual, quarterly, weekly, hourly, even variable unit-based billing for volume-based services. To learn more about how Practice Ignition can help your firm eliminate accounts receivable and for 50% off your first three months, head over to earmarkcpe.com slash pi. That is earmarkcpe.com slash pi. Practice Ignition, online payments designed for CPA firms. Okay, so let's get back on tracks. Uh, thank you for yeah. taking that tangent with me. Um, and, and so where were we in the process? We had just finished our consultation meeting, yeah. our first meeting with the client. Mm-hmm. I assume that before we let them go, we schedule the second call to go over uh, the- Yeah, generally, or, it, it depends on how we are approached with that client and how complex they are. Um, either we'll schedule in their time for a call so we can deliver that proposal um, in you know in person via call, um, or we'll say hey we'll follow up in a couple of days right and we may deliver yeah. the proposal in our format through email with a video or um, you know through another means uh, you know even send up another call later on uh, we'll kind of kind of at least prep and say here's what to expect next um, anytime we do anything sales related we always want to end it up with here's what to expect next in this process um, so we're not so- leaving them painting. So you ha- you you do it two different ways. So you'll sometimes do the proposal mm-hmm. in person, mm-hmm. or you will also deliver it via email with a video. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, like, what ma- what makes you decide which one? Is it is it the size of the client? Is it how much time you have? Because uh, some people would, some people say yeah. you should never ever give a proposal without being there to answer, answer objections. Yeah. 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 So some of it depends on. I would say the the size and the simplicity or the complexity of the client. Um, the more complex the client, the more things that we were proposing, or maybe even like off the wall ideas we're going to throw out there, we're going to do that over the phone uh, over a video call, um, just because we do need to handle objections and there probably needs to be some clarification on the client's end as to what we're saying. For some things that are simple, like hey, we're going to do bookkeeping services, or we're going to do um, a tax return and some tax planning, that's a little bit more standardized. And so as such, we can kind of say, well, here's what it is, or here's the three options we have, and here's how we work this, right? So tax is a great example of this. Um, generally, we'll never give a proposal for tax uh, you know, in live person or over the video. Typically, we will... Um, send it out with a kind of a video loom type thing attached mm-hmm. with it um, and kind of just talking through what's going on. Cause it's really, we're offering at that point, there's really kind of a limit of what we're going to be offering them and doing that work uh, and limited options they can choose from. And so it's pretty clear cut as to, okay, well, here's what you do next. Um, either take it or leave it at that point. And for our listeners, Josh mentioned loom, which is a very simple app that lets you record your screen and yourself and, and send a video to a client where you are in a little uh, circle yeah. in the corner of the screen and you can walk them through your proposal. So it's a great way to get that in-person feeling without having to actually book a meeting. So exactly. great for those exactly. smaller clients or smaller engagements or one-offs. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It makes it, okay. it makes it simple. It makes it clear. And it, but it also gives that personal touch, right? We don't, what we don't want to do is just the blind send the proposal and say, well, here's our proposal. Let me know if you have any questions and walk away, right? Like, yeah, and that's when you hear crickets normally. Yeah, that's right? when you're going to lose so. proposals because right. you, you kind of abandoned the process at the point. So you are using practice ignition yes. for your proposals. And you mentioned that you do three options typically. That's correct. Yep. In a proposal. So, you know, obviously there are way too many variations and combinations to go through all the different types of proposals that you do, but maybe you could kind of give me an idea of the three different tiers for a very common situation. Yeah. So like, let's take a, you know, brewery client coming to us, want us to handle their bookkeeping and accounting needs. Um, generally the three packages, at least we're going to start from initially. Now again, that could change client to client. We could add things or take things out. But generally there, when we think about three options, there's either the really high option that has basically everything we do in it. Um, so they're basically at that point almost subscribing to our firm 
and the services we provide. And then you have the low option, which is like the bare bones, like we are going to do transactional level work only. Do not, you know, think about any advisory work. Do not think about asking us questions. Here's what that is. And the middle is kind of an in-between of all that. Um, so like it would be like basic bookkeeping services would be at the low end. Um, then we'd probably do in the middle end, we usually do like bookkeeping plus a quarterly strategy call and maybe some KPI analysis. Um, and then the high end, we're moving into more like monthly strategy, forecast and KPIs, people advisory, all those type of things, right? And so um, we kind of give those different optionality in there, depending on where they want to go, right? We talk a lot about what happens in option three um, and all the things we do typically on the sales call. Um, and then and they see in those options and when we discuss it with them, we're kind of, okay, well, here's what we're peeling out now. And here's that new scope. And then here's what we're peeling out again. And here's what that low end is. And so um, it really kind of gives them that optionality. Okay, either you're going to work with us and do everything that we do. And we're really going to take care of you. And you're kind of that concierge type client with us to here's kind of that middle of road package. You're not getting everything, but we're going to provide you some more than just the basics. And then here's the basics, right? So they really have a clear distinction of what you're really getting from us. And, and it's important in that highest tier proposal to really throw everything in there mm -hmm. because otherwise, how would your clients or prospects know everything that you offer? Do. Right. And, and it also helps to anchor the prices mm -hmm. because I, I, I assume that that highest tier, which now how many people actually choose that? It's probably a very low percentage. Yeah. Usually uh, like 10 percent ish or so are going to choose the highest tier. Yeah. Exactly. So it's a small percentage that are in the um, you know first class or business yeah. class seating on your airplane of your firm, but that sets the expectation for everyone else that well, I guess what I'm paying for coach is actually really a decent price because yeah. it's it's you know an order of magnitude perhaps less expensive <laughs> exactly than what I would be paying if I got everything. Yeah. And it also helps them understand too by making that choice, you're choosing not to get other things, right? So. Um, by choosing the middle option, you're choosing not to get forecasting services or a monthly call or a weekly call from us, right? Like you've elected out of that scope and provision. Um, and so if you do want it, we're going to come back to that, uh, you know, that third option to say, okay, well, if you really want these things, you're asking for these things, you need to be in the upper tier to get those things. Um, and I think it also helps to understand, you know, particularly if clients are comparing you to other firms, all the things that you offer, right? So um, you know, we can't make the assumption that our clients know what we do. Uh, yes. I think sometimes yeah. we do that and they say, okay, we well, do. yeah, we do. We're a CPA firm. We do CPA things, right? But our firm does things that are different than other firms. And we think about it in ways that are different than our firms, just like any other firm there is. Right. And so being clear about that upfront helps create that distinction uh, and really shows, okay, well, here's what you're going to get when you work with us. And if you're looking at other proposals from other firms, you're going to see those distinctions and even more clarity as you compare. And so we want to make sure they understand, okay, here's all the things we can do. Because what we don't want to do is, and this has happened to us, we've worn this the hard way, is we do bookkeeping services and like, oh, I was needing help with some forecasts. And so I call this, you know, virtual CFO service and they're going to do the forecast. And it's like, well, we could have done that for you, but we didn't really, we're, we're, we're giving them that information and knowledge the tone right. that, right? We yeah. gave them a proposal for bookkeeping services. And so that's all they assumed that we would do. Really good points. So we, we've, we've mentioned the technology, but we haven't really talked about the benefits of it yet of using proposal management yeah. software or yeah. engagement letter software, whatever you want to call it to set the context. Let's, let's think back to what many firms still do. And what I was forced to do when I was a manager in a large firm for about a year, and it was to copy a Word template mm -hmm. onto my desktop and then customize that Word document to create an engagement letter for my client, which I then emailed to them as a PDF. Mm -hmm. I hoped they signed it and returned it, and then we could begin the billing process. Yeah. So... For those who are new to this concept of uh, proposal software, like what what are the benefits? What are the key benefits for you and your firm to using yeah. a, a system for this, for to paying for software for this? Because yeah, I could do it for free pretty much with Word, right? Right. Yeah, I think there's. I mean, there's a, a lot of things. I think one is one the standardization, making sure that you're doing this for every client that you work with, right? So. 
Um, I think it's very easy to get a client that comes to you and says, hey, I'd love you to do some tax work or some bookkeeping work or this cleanup project. Can you start the day? And it's like, oh, yeah, I can do it. And you start just working on it, right? And you haven't set scope. You haven't set that engagement letter out, right? You haven't gone through the proper process here. And so, you know, using a proposal manager software kind of forces your hand to do the right process for each and every client that you do. I think it also helps you kind of automate that process and make it simpler on your end and simpler on your client's end, right? So you mentioned like, hey, we do that Word document, right? You know, we save it, we update it, we send it out. And maybe when you do it on, you know, one-offs here and there, that's not that big of a deal. But with firms that are doing tax work or you're doing a lot of sales work, like that's a lot of work all the time that you're doing. Uh, and that can really be slow. And again, you could, you know, try to bypass or skip things or shortcut it, which is only going to hurt you later on. Um, so then having a system in place that allows you to quickly send out that proposal to your client that's completely branded to you, that has your logos on it, uh, that's very easy from a customer experience perspective of, um, you know, understanding what's going on. I think it's helpful. Um, you know, making sure like you collect payment details, uh, when you send all that together and yes. get that engagement letter signed is key. Uh, I gotta say that is my favorite, right? It's, yeah. it's, you can, you can require the client to enter payment information and schedule the payment when they sign. Yeah. So so your team doesn't accidentally start working before they've really committed to you. Exactly. I, yeah. Which is key. Yeah. It, and you're not, and that also make sure you're not doing work for free and then make sure you're not spending a bunch of time after the fact trying to collect on that invoice and the bill. Right. So getting that payment detail in there and then having the engagement letter signed, right. Um, and all, all together is I think pretty critical. Right. And that's kind of what practice does, right. You take it from that proposal to paid, uh, component in a really short period of time. Uh, and then also automate the invoice and the billing process, right? So the front end piece of getting your client to sign that engagement letter, accept your terms and accept your scope. And then at the back end of actually getting paid for all that work, right? You know, I think a lot of times we throw, you know, redo it or, or we have like an administrative assistant that does it. And we spend a lot of time there that we don't actually need to spend, right? We can automate that, mm -hmm. make it simpler, um, you know, automate the invoice and then billing, right? So you're not have to think about, okay, well, it's the beginning of the month. Let's get the invoices out or um, let's try to collect on these deadbeats who aren't paying us, right? Uh, like that stuff is automatically happening. You're ensuring that it's automatically happening and you're automatically getting paid yep. without having to uh, do that late work to get paid. So you've put together the proposal, mm -hmm. you've done it in PI and, and you've met, you're meeting with the client. Do, how often do they actually sign the proposal right there in the meeting? Is that a common thing or do they typically go back and think about it and then sign it? You know, it's interesting. I think um, it's more common than you think where we'll have them either sign in the meeting or like we'll get off the call and, like two minutes later, it's we get the email saying it's been signed and like we're ready to go. Um, you know, making it easier for the client ensures that it's something that happens quicker uh, mm -hmm. rather than not. Uh, and I think clients, especially if they buy into you, if you did your sales process right, like they've bought into you, like they, it's like, yeah, I want to work with you. Like you're the expert who can help me out with this problem. You work in my industry, you understand my pain points and my issues. I'm bought into what you're doing. I agree to this option I'm going to choose. And then like, let's get going here. Um, and so, you know, given that option or basically the ability for the client to sign right away is key versus, right, well, I'll send you the engagement letter after this call and I don't get to it for a couple hours or till the next morning. And then it gets sent out and then, you know, it sits in their inbox for a while and they got to figure out the sign in and send it back in my direction. It just takes too long. And that's in a way you can start to lose sales that way, right? Like that we've made it a more painful process to engage with us. And uh, the simpler we make it for them, the simpler it is for us to close that sale. So I, I want to finish up with actually probably the trickiest question for you. I apologize. Okay. But it, it has to do with scope, scoping out the advisory, yeah. because we're talking about selling advisory. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, to kind of to sum up, we've we've talked about how if you're selling advisory, you can't just have a quick and dirty sales process. You've yeah. got to have this extended process where you're gathering information. You're doing at least two meetings, potentially more with the client. You are really being thoughtful about the proposal. You're talking it over with your team. You are using multiple pricing methodologies because advisory services are ambiguous. Right? Mm -hmm. You got to kind of try a few different things to get the right price. Uh, when it comes to actually what is in that engagement letter, what is in the scope of the service, mm -hmm. how do you make sure that it doesn't become a total 
shit show. <laughs> yeah. I think there's two things. I think it's one is understanding the, the skills that we have, right? So not telling our client we can do whatever you want if that's not our skill set, right? So like, we don't have the skill set to do R&D credits. I know it. I understand it. But I don't have the skill set to necessarily do all that work myself. Um, so I don't, I better not be putting that in the scope or saying I can do all these things to my client, mm -hmm. uh, when I can't. Right. So it's understand, okay, what are our own limitations of what we can do? Um, and then when we translate that into a scope and, and get that in front of the client, um, being very specific as to what is in that scope and what is not in that scope. Right. Even with things that with advisory forecasting is a great example of this, right? Like if I say, okay, we're going to do forecasting services, services for you, what does that actually look like? Is it like I'm updating it on a daily basis? Are you, we having a lot of conversations back and forth about it? Or is there a defined process as to, okay, when you sign up for forecasting services, here's our process and how it works. And here's what you're going to expect. And this includes having the monthly meeting. This does not include, you know, daily check-ins or whatever that may be, right? Yeah. Um, and take some of that assumptionality out of the scope. Because um, again, I think, for us, we understand and we get it, but our clients don't. And they may be coming from a firm that said they'd use forecasting services, but they did it in a much different way. Um, right. Or there are different things going on there that we weren't thinking about, right? So the more we can be clear about the scope and what is in that scope and kind of you know nicely define that as much as we can, uh, the better off we're going to be because then we're going to avoid those scope creep or scope seep opportunities that can come into play um, and avoid some of the assumptions that, you know, our client may assume one thing, we assumed another. Uh, and we mm -hmm. want to avoid that as much as possible because that's where friction happens and relationships go south and things like that. So the clarity yeah. is key. And we obviously can't get into defining the scope of every single possible service here, but uh, just one thing that I like to think about or two things actually, whenever I'm defining scope are frequency mm -hmm. and the deliverable mm -hmm. and trying to, for everything that's in that services package, define the frequency. So daily, weekly, mm -hmm. monthly, quarterly, annually, yeah. how often are we doing that thing? How mm -hmm. often are we meeting with you? If our advisory meetings include you meeting with people, who are those people and when, how often? Yeah. And even if that's not what really happens and you end up spending more or less time, you can always go back to that and point to it when it comes time to do an adjustment. Yep. Right. If it ends up being, you're calling us daily mm -hmm. and we'd agreed on weekly meetings. Now it might be time to bump you up to that premium package. Yeah. Um, and then in, in terms of the deliverable, you, you, you mentioned this, it's the, um, what are they actually getting? So when it's bookkeeping, what do they get? every month. Do they get a set of financial statements? Do they get more than that? Uh, do they get a dashboard? The forecast sure. is a good example too. Like how far out does the forecast go? Mm -hmm. What, how do we deliver it to them? How often yeah. does it get updated? Cash management, same thing, right? Yeah. 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 That all ha you have to be, you have to be clear there because again, that that's where you're going to have issues in the relationship with your client is when you're not on the same page and then putting together yeah. an engagement letter and putting together your scope in is a way to get on the same page with each other. And that's also, also a way, especially when it comes to frequency and the deliverables is how, if you're struggling to figure out even like how to do like a three option proposal and differentiate a service over multiple tiers, that's a great way to differentiate is okay. Well, frequency. maybe the frequency is going to be monthly, yep. you know, weekly, daily, you know, depending on the package or yep. uh, that deliverable is going to, you know, ha happen in a certain way um, depending on the package. And so um, that's also a great way to kind of show that difference uh, in there uh, as well. But uh, yep. being clear on all that, I think is, is key. And I think, you know, I've learned the hard way too often of when I scope things too um, vaguely or, um, you know, took too many assumptions in the play in creating my scope, uh, where that came back to bite me, uh, later on when clients were asking for things, they said, well, your, your engagement letter didn't say I can't do this, or I assume that's what you meant when you put that in the engagement letter. And mm -hmm. so you don't want to have that fight of what you meant six months ago, <laughs> cause that's a fight you're going to probably lose. Uh, yes. and so you want to make sure you have that, that clear and upfront and, uh, and you have to make sure you communicate, communicate that to your team as well, because just because I sold it that way, if I just give it to my team, say, okay, we're doing forecasts and then they just do whatever they want to do, right? Whatever the client asks, then you're going to get way out of scope real quickly too. So the team has to be on board with that as well. That's so important. It's not just for the 
client. It's actually even more for the team yeah. is the scoping. And that's why it's important to bring them into it if possible mm -hmm. so that they know what they're, I mean, cause you're signing them up for work. So <laughs> exactly. it's good to have, if you can get them helping to price it, then they can yeah. help you scope it. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, um, the other, the other factor is, uh, yeah, who's going to be doing it too. Mm -hmm. That's another good way to differentiate. So yep. like just an example from my firm, we did bookkeeping, a lot of bookkeeping and at the highest tier, it might be daily, daily bookkeeping, then weekly, then quarterly as you go down. Yeah. And the, the frequency of meetings might go from weekly to monthly to quarterly. And that all just sets an expectation as to how much you're going to draw upon our resources, but mm -hmm. without us needing to count hours, right. I think that's really important because if, if that's, this is why advisory has failed historically, mm -hmm. right? Is, is we tried to bill hourly for it and it becomes very expensive. Yeah. And, and so, and then people don't want to pay for it. Right. So, so by setting these, the scope in this way, mm -hmm. We don't have to count the hours, but we also know that we're not going to run out of capacity. Right. Well, and I think, yeah, to your point there, you know, again, when advisory has been typically been done, it's been done by the partner level, which is a higher billing rate. And you're going to, you're going to get that bill up pretty quickly when the partner's, you know, yeah. doing some time on it. Right. And so, um, I, I think being, you know, clear on that scope, being clear with your team, uh, and, and, and pricing that accordingly allows you to, um, really leverage your resource appropriately. And that's, you know, one of your biggest roles as a firm owner or a partner or a manager in the firm is how do you leverage your resources and manage that capacity? Um, and that helps you in that sales process if you understand that well, um, because that will help inform your pricing and ensure that you're taking on the right work for your team that you can actually do. Josh, thanks so much for your time. If our listeners would like to connect with you online, learn more about what you're up to, where would you send them? Yeah, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you search me out there, you'll find me there. Otherwise, you can reach out to me uh, via my email, josh at lancecpa.com. I've been speaking with Josh Lance CPA. I'm your host, Blake Oliver CPA. Thank you for listening to the Earmark Accounting Podcast. Josh, I'll see you around. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Blake here again. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like to get CPE for listening to episodes like this one and many more accounting and tax podcasts, go to earmarkcpe.com, sign up and get early access when the app launches later in 2021.